Good afternoon. My name is Takiwa Smith, founder and executive director of Science, Engineering, and Mathematics Link Incorporated, also known as SCM Link. And I want to welcome you to our Math and Science Career Academy STEM in the City Workshop. The STEM in the City Workshop is a program of our Math and Science Career Academy to expose you to careers in earth and environmental sciences. These sciences are really, really important because they impact our everyday lives, such as air quality, water quality, our environment. And so we thought it's important for you to learn about those these fields, how they impact you, but most importantly, see role models in these fields. So if those things interest you, you can know what areas you can study in school and how you can use science to make an impact in the world, to combat climate change, to make sure we have clean drinking water, and all the things that earth and environmental scientists do to study the earth and make the world habitable and combat what we do as humans to impact the earth. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our program coordinator, Carlin Pounders, who is going to introduce today's speaker. Hi everyone. So we're in for such a treat today. We have a wonderful workshop for you. And our featured speaker is Dr. Vernon Morris. Dr. Morris is the director of the School of Mathematical and Natural Sciences at the New College of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences at Arizona State University. He is also a professor of chemistry and environmental sciences at ASU. Prior to coming to ASU, Dr. Morris was a professor of chemistry and atmospheric sciences at Howard University. While at Howard, Dr. Morris served as chair of the Department of Chemistry and founding director of the HU graduate program in at atmospheric sciences, also known as HUPUS. HUPUS is the first PhD, the first PhD degree granting atmospheric sciences program at any minority serving institution and, it, and is a national leader in the production of minority PhDs in its field. Dr. Morris's research focuses on the chemical evolution of atmospheric particles during their resident time, residence times in the lower atmosphere and the implications to urban aerobiology, climate, and cloud processes. Dr. Morris earned his BS degrees in chemistry and mathematics from Morehouse College and his PhD in geophysical sciences from the Georgia Institute of Technology. So without further ado, I will hand it off to Dr. Morris. Thank you, Carlin. Um, let me see. I don't make any mistakes here. Uh, thanks a lot, actually. Um, that introduction is better than any introduction that I would give for myself, uh, but I will stick with the script. Um, good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you are uh, tuning in. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here with the colleague and friend, uh, share some of my science and, and hopefully um, inspire, encourage uh, some of you out there uh, to follow on a scientific path of your um, choice, of your curiosity, of your inspiration. So first, uh, as Carlin said, I'm a scientist, I'm an academic, uh, I'm an, an administrator, academic administrator right now by profession. Uh, the slide says which of the following are true. So you kind of know the first one is true. Um, a lot of times when I start off, um, I ask what comes to your mind when you think of a scientist? Um, and uh, a lot of times when you ask people to think of a scientist or visualize a scientist when they close their eyes, they, they, there is a visual image. Quite often it doesn't look like me. Quite often it doesn't look like a number of the folks who might've been on STEM in the city if you've been tuning in. Um, and I think we, one of the things that I'd hope to do over my professional lifetime is dislodge the singular image of who a scientist is, who can be a scientist, what makes up a scientist as much as possible. So when I say which of the following are true, they're actually all true. 
Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the third bullet as we go along. And if anyone wants to guess the five languages that I've learned and spoken, uh, maybe put those in the chatter. Uh, let's come back to that at the end of the, uh, of the talk. Um, but um, one of the most exciting things about, uh, it's kept me in science for as long as I've been in science, is the travel aspects and the connection to nature. Uh, as Dr. Uh, Smith was talking about, there's, we're inherently connected to nature. Uh, we're inherently connected to climate. And so as an environmental scientist or a geophysical scientist, understanding the physics and the chemistry and the biology of how our environment, our earth system evolves can be done theoretically, but it also can be done by going to those places where the evolution is taking place in volcanoes, in the atmosphere, in the ocean, on the land and very sensitive parts of the land. And so uh, I've been fortunate to be able to travel to a number of those locations and do the type of science that can translate our understanding of the processes that are happening in each of those environments into applications that help protect us from or allow us to better adapt to severe weather or climate, uh, climate change and environmental threats. So I'm currently at ASU, as uh, Carlin said, ASU is in the Salt River Valley, and the Salt River Valley uh, are the ancestral lands of the Akamel Odom and uh, Piposh peoples. They've been here for centuries and centuries before the United States existed, um, constructed canals and agricultural systems and um, living ecosystems that allow us to be here. And so I honor them uh, not just by mentioning them, but by respecting their presence. And uh, each time I talk, recognizing that we are guests on their land and their stewardship allows us to be here. Uh, Arizona State University has four campuses, uh, all rest in that Salt River Valley and are uh, equally uh, guests on Akamal Odom land. Um, but Arizona State is huge, uh, 103,000 uh, over 103,000 students, um, one of the largest, if not the largest in the university, and we're still growing. Um, in addition to be thriving in terms of growth, um, we consistently rank uh, number one in innovation, uh, which is evidenced by uh, being top 10 in pat uh, patents, 1% in prestigious universities. And these are just some highlights that we like to put out there to encourage you. If you're interested in coming to ASU, I must say as an administrator and professor, I'm looking for great students to come up and experience what we have for you. So my journey is, is not typical, but I find that a lot of African-American PhDs, a lot of Latinx PhDs, a lot of indigenous PhDs also have atypical pathways. Um, when people ask me where I'm from, usually I say Washington, D.C., um, and that's because I lived there so long. When I was growing up, I lived in 14 different cities over my 18 years of, uh, first 18 years of life, including um, living in Japan for four of those years. Um, and so I didn't have a strong place attachment. Uh, I also wasn't quite sure I wanted to go to college, to tell you the truth. Um, I was still debating that um, because I was boxing well, because I was thinking about going in the Air Force. Um, a number of things were on my mind at the time. So I um, was waffling up until very late. Um, as it turned out, um, I did not have a huge science experience when I was growing up. Um, I never participated in the science fair. Um, many of the times that I was in science class, um, I would get moved out of the science class and put into another uh, vocational class because they felt that black students didn't belong in the advanced math courses or advanced chemistry courses. And so, you know, I have to thank my parents for being very astute and vigilant on what was going on to keep me in those classes to help me be prepared. Uh, for when I ultimately went to college. And so I went to the Atlanta University Center in Atlanta, Georgia, and I 
originally I selected, uh, believe it or not, Morris Brown College because it was an AME uh, based college. Um, but when I got there, um, changed my mind uh, to Morehouse uh, and uh, ended up going to Morehouse. And the rest of these sort of bullets on this slide, um, I don't know if they're visible or not. Typically, you don't put slides that have this much language on it. But from Morehouse, I went to Georgia Tech. Uh, from Georgia Tech, uh, after that experience, I went to Sicily to study astrochemistry. Uh, from Sicily, I went to California, the Lawrence Livermore National Labs, which is a Department of Energy lab um, that at that time was in the middle of nowhere in Livermore, California. I think a lot of gentrification and spread has connected Livermore to every place else in California. Uh, I went from Lawrence Livermore Labs, where I was uh, doing computer programming, to University of California, Davis, to look at cometary chemistry and chemistry that happens in deep space. Um, and then to Howard. I did a stint at NASA for three years. I came back to Howard, uh, founded the graduate program in atmospheric sciences, as well as uh, a NOAA center, uh, both of which have been going on for about two decades. And then I made a transition uh, during the middle of the pandemic to come to ASU. And that is a whole story uh, in and of itself, but I'm at Arizona State University uh, leading a fantastic unit that is highly interdisciplinary and I think reflective of where I think science needs to go. Certainly geoscience as it can incorporate humanists and social scientists, behavioral scientists, artists, um, basically any discipline that can be conceived can be incorporated into a geoscience, environmental science type application. And through that time, um, a number of things have been generated in terms of knowledge and publications and research, but the most valuable product from my work are the students. Um, as about 150 students, undergraduate students, there's 20 PhDs, I think there's 18 rolling uh, masters. Um, so rapidly approaching 200 students or so that I've mentored and their impact on the scientific community is the one that's going to be irreplaceable uh, in my mind. Um, and as an example of that, Henry McBay was the person who, when I went to Morehouse, convinced me to major in chemistry as well as mathematics and chemistry um, in a random sort of act of kindness and uh, a random interaction to tell you the truth. Backstory is that I got to college as with many uh, freshmen. I was having a blast during freshman week and I had spent the majority of my money that I was supposed to spend on tuition um, on exploring Atlanta and going to the freshman parties and you know buying new clothes because I had to keep up with uh, other folks who were there and um, ended up about two weeks into school and realizing I couldn't afford to be there. Uh, and so I was running off campus. I was looking for jobs to try to, um, you know, I was too embarrassed to tell my parents at that time and um, too embarrassed to reach out for help in a constructive way. And so I was stewing in that for a couple of weeks. Uh, and then started looking for jobs and finally came up on something. And at that time, there was no cell phones. Uh, there were pay phones uh, that you could get to. But if someone said, be at this place at this time and you happen to be running late, you either need to rush to get there uh, or go run to a pay phone and say, I'll be there at this time. But there's no sort of constant contact like we have now. So I was running literally off campus. I ran. I was planning on running through a building to get to the gates to get off campus to go to this job opportunity. And the building I was running through was the chemistry building. And so as I was running, you know, I came in one door, the hallway stretches down at the other end, there's another door and then the gates to get off campus are on the other side. So that's why people tended to cut through this building. Um, but as I was running down the hall, basically I ran into Dr. McBay and he, you know, stopped me and said, what's, you know, what's the problem? What's the rush? Uh, got me to settle down and tell him. And what he said is, look, I'll give you the money that you need to stay in school if you major in chemistry. And I said, of course. And he said, I'll buy the books. I'll buy the computer. I'll take care of, you know, this first semester to get you back on track. 
But he said, but if you major in chemistry, you got to major in math. I said, I'll do that. He said, well, if you major in chemistry and math, you might as well major in physics. I said, I'll do that too. Uh, and that was how I selected my majors in undergrad and how I got on the path that I am still on today. So these random acts are really important, uh, at least in, in my life, uh, and I think in many's. Um, sometimes we they're not quite as profoundly, um, uh, you know, remembered. But I think when we go back in time and try to think of decisions that we made that enabled success, oftentimes it's an individual who was there at the right time and in the right place. So as I said, my trajectory rolls through a number of things. Uh, I started off in, in designing molecules and doing theoretical calculations to understand how molecules form from their atoms, um, how they break apart and how they transform in a very theoretical um, way. Uh, and that's what I did for much of my undergrad and PhD. And then for my uh, postdoctoral, after I got my PhD and went to Sicily and went to Livermore and went to uh, UC Davis, I worked in astrochemistry, um, planetary atmospheres and sort of data analysis in combining measurements and building different types of instrumentation to look at processes that were associated with um, small molecule reactions, as well as reactions that led to the formation of particles. And I'll talk about why that's unique in a little bit, but it's, it's easy for reactions or easier for reactions to recur in a liquid and form products in that liquid. It's sort of straightforward for reactions to occur in a gas and then produce gas products but it's a lot, a very complex process to have reactions occur in one phase, a gas or a liquid phase, and then produce a solid phase, or for reactions to happen in a solid phase and produce a liquid, or one of the other combinations of those fundamental phases. And so I was very interested in that, and that the physical chemistry of those processes, and that ultimately led to applications of how small particles can affect planetary scale processes or global scale processes. So that brought me to climate change research. And then ultimately um, I came back down in scale. So I started off looking at molecules and looking at molecules in space and in atmospheres that form particles and how those particles and gases influenced climate to how do those particles influence people? And so right now I do a lot of work in environmental justice, air pollution, chemistry, and aerobiology, and really looking at the same types of processes that I started looking at 30 years ago, but trying to translate what we understand about those processes into how we respond to the environment in terms of our health, in terms of our environmental quality, and in terms of how we have to evolve our understanding of these as climate changes around us. And so um, I really enjoy, really love mentoring students along this pathway. And so these are just uh, some snapshots of some of the students in my group at Howard in the Philippines. Uh, some of my students from uh, El Paso are pictured here uh, as well and in different environments. And I'll talk, I think, as time rolls on about a little bit about um, what we do in all of these places. but. I train students to apply physical chemical principles to the um, measurement and characterization of particles in our environment. And usually these are particles that we cannot see. And so that's why I call what I'm about to talk about the hidden influence of dust. Um, we refer to these as dust particles or dust aerosols. I'll use aerosol and particle interchangeably. But typically the particles themselves are very minute. They are particles that we can't see. Um, in fact, they are so small that if you were to uh, pluck a hair from your head, a single hair, strand of hair, the particles that I'm talking about would fit on the cross section of that hair. Now, if you think about it, if you took, plucked a piece of hair and stood 
across the room and held it up, most people wouldn't be able to see that. If you went outside and you walked down a mile away and you held it up, almost nobody would be able to honestly say that they could see that hair that you're holding. If they went 10 miles, there's absolutely no chance they would see the hair. Yet, when you look up in the sky and you see a cloud, what you're actually seeing are particles that are on the order of this size, scattering light in a really unique way. And because of the way that they interact with the light, you see this big mass up there. But what you're seeing is an effect that gives you the knowledge of the presence of particles of this type. And so that's one example of how these minute particles, which you cannot see, are manifest in ways that you can see in large physical uh, uh, ways. So I like to zoom back down, though. And so I zoom back down to the size of the individual particles that are in aggregate looking like clouds or looking like fogs or looking like dust storms or looking like air pollution smog and try to understand what's happening on the surfaces of those particles. And so there's a surface chemistry, a surface physics, and actually a surface microbiology that's really interesting on these tiny particles. That depends though, if the particle is dominated by the surface sort of structure, if it's a solid dominant particle with maybe a thin layer of liquid around the solid. But you can also have particles on the other side of the spectrum, particles that have a little bit of solid that allowed you to nucleate or grow the liquid around it, but are mostly liquid with a little bit of solid on the middle. Those are dominated by chemistry in the bulk, is what we say, or chemistry inside that volume of liquid that surrounds that small particle. And so these are sort of the two extremes of um, atmospheric particles that we have to worry about. And these particles could also occur in the ocean and in different types of uh, mixed phase solids but they have a unique impact depending on how much, what the solid to liquid ratio is, what the composition of the solid is versus the composition of the liquid around it, um, and whether they're uh, exposed to different physical stresses, uh, light or radiation, um, heat, um, you know, different types of pressure uh, can also affect these. If there's ionic processes that are going around that's exposed to a plasma, there can be very different changes in it. So there are very complex things that happen in particles that are not present if it's purely a liquid or it's purely a solid or it's purely a gas. And that complexity is really what draws me to look at these, these things. Um, you mentioned, uh, food and climate and different sorts of environmental stresses before, well, it turns out, as I hope to show, that these invisible particles play a role in food production. They play a role, a strong role in climate change, which may also impact uh, food production. And they play a strong role in environmental health because we have to breathe these particles. Um, we breathe air at a, hopefully if we're healthy, at a pretty regular rate, um, thousands of liters a day. And depending on how large the particle is, your body is not tuned to filter out those particles. And as climate changes, there are more and more particles in the environment and in the atmosphere that are really foreign objects that we have to try to adapt to filter out uh, in order to be healthy. And so it's a complex sort of figure here that's probably a little bit too fine but basically, depending on the size of the particles, they impact in the human system in different places. So your largest particles, even though you still can't see them very well, are going to impact typically in your nasal uh, or pharynx region of your body. As they get smaller, they get past those uh, biological filters, I'm sorry, and they move down into your lung area and sediment in your lungs and the bronchi. But if they're fine enough, small enough, they can actually get down to the alveolar region and get into your bloodstream. And in each of these places, depending on what the biology of those particles are, you can have different health effects, even though in the largest, in the upper part of your um, 
pharynx, upper part of your biological system, the human body, you, you'll basically sneeze these most of these back out. That's what you're best adapted to get rid of. So pepper, for example, gets in the air, you sneeze, you're done with it. It can't affect you after that. It can trigger some other things, but it's not going to affect you chemically or physically beyond that point. But if those particles were a thousand times smaller, instead of making you sneeze, you breathe it, you go about your life, but then they start loading chemicals in your lungs or into your bloodstream, and that can have much different effects. And so I study a particular type of aerosol um, that is connected to a global circuit of dust, mineral dust, um, that uh, also has effects uh, throughout the, um, I don't know, this does not, it's not playing the movie, also has effects throughout the globe. And so, the cartoon on the left-hand side basically shows that deserts are distributed sort of north and south and even along the equator. And because of the global motion of the atmosphere around the earth, a dust storm occurs in one of these huge deserts and then it moves the dust around globally. And it's because it's moving the dust around globally, the chemical reactions of that dust, the microbiology of that dust and the physics of that dust actually have global impacts, as well as the local impacts where these storms are. And I study sort of these global or long range impacts of the dust. Um, I do that on ships. Um, what I'm gonna show is a couple of satellite pictures really quickly uh, as time moves on uh, about the, the riskiest ship trip I ever took, ship trip. Uh, research uh, expedition on the ocean. Um, it was in 2005. And if anyone remembers 2005, um, that was one of the most um, active hurricane seasons that we can recall in recent history. Um, and we sailed during that hurricane season. Now, leading up to that season, you would not know that at any particular time, there might be one, two, three hurricanes. And in fact, we sailed shortly after Katrina. Uh, we sailed in November 2005, and so Katrina had hit, I think, in, uh, I think it was October. Uh, it was about a month before. We could see all the damage in New Orleans. We actually drove down to Houma, uh, Louisiana, and sailed um, from Houma, Louisiana, down to Venezuela. And so, yes, it was an active hurricane season. It was a devastating hurricane that had just hit the Gulf. Um actually had just hit ports um, close to where we were going to sail from, but can lightning strike in the same place? Well, actually it can, um, but not often. So we sailed out of Houma, Louisiana, through the Gulf of Mexico, along the Bahama channels, down through the Mona Passage between Puerto Rico and Hispaniola, and then down to Venezuela. Uh, and what we were looking at is uh, air quality in these oil producing regimes and how that might affect the entire Caribbean basin. What we didn't anticipate was that as we went out during a lull in hurricane activity after Katrina, that the hurricane season was going to amplify. And so as we went south, um, within two weeks, um, we were in the middle of three hurricanes uh, with nowhere to go at sea. And I can tell you this is uh, the most exciting and most scary expedition that I've ever been on. Um, we were looking at 40 foot waves. Um, we were too far away from land uh, to get back to any safe port. Um, the positioning of the hurricanes were such that we could not go south. We could not go uh, to the west. Um, we were sort of in the leeward range of the um, lower, Lesser Antilles and another system was actually coming in that was supposed to intensify. So we could not risk sort of going Northeast to get away from the three systems. And so we had to ride it out in the middle of the ocean. Um, and so we went through uh, two days of those 40 foot waves on a fairly small ship uh, and finally got um, through that uh, as the systems tended to move away from where we were they moved rapidly to our west and we were able to get south uh, and continue the mission. Um, 
And I had five students uh, aboard that ship. And so when I say I've been on 17 different missions and we haven't lost a single person, it's not because there was never a risk. It was because we had a great crew uh, and folks who helped us out. So I'm going to try to talk pretty rapidly about um, what does a geoscientist do at sea, especially one who studies dust in the atmosphere? You know, why would you go to sea? And that was a question that I was asked a lot as I was proposing uh, to conduct the study that I'm going to talk about. Um, there's a lot of skepticism. Um, some of it was because of what I look like and what was a, frankly speaking, what was a black guy uh, doing asking for uh, the premier research vessel to go chase dust storms across the ocean? What was he, why would he think that we would give him this ship to do that? Um, and it turned out one, no one else has done it. Two, it needed to be done to improve the billions of dollars that we put in space in satellites to understand the ocean and things that are happening at the surface and the dust is in a way interfering all the time and degrading the signal in ways that we don't understand. And so in order to protect those, that multi-billion dollar investment, somebody actually needs to characterize all of that dust. Um, two, the dust models were wrong. The dust models assume that the dust had no chemistry on the surface. It had no significant biology on the surface. It had static physics so that all dust was treated exactly the same. That's wrong. And we have thus hence um, provided the data sets to change those in models and improve the models significantly, both with respect to understanding ocean properties from space understanding the atmosphere from space and actually our numerical weather models. Uh, and then finally, the dust interacts with hurricanes significantly. And we don't understand why and how, uh, what the processes are that really drive those changes to whether dust will accelerate the formation of a hurricane, will damp out the hurricane, will um, cease, you know, modify or ameliorate a hurricane season. And really some of the longer term effects of aerosols on the clouds in the tropics. And the tropics, like the Arctic, is a very sensitive climate zone. We really have to understand the roles of all the components of the atmosphere in these climate sensitive regions to be able to predict climate change in an accurate way. And so I continue to present uh, these arguments, which um, regardless of who they're coming from, um, were good arguments. And ultimately, uh, with some allies inside of NOAA, we were able to get a pilot study done. And it turned out on that pilot study and the pilot cruise track, and the cruise track is just, this is how the ship moved about over the course of the experiment that we wanted to conduct. So we started off in March uh, 2004, and we basically set off from Barbados um, moved across the tropical Atlantic Ocean, and you can see some sort of changes in the direction of the ship at certain times. We look south, and we go due east, and we come a little bit north. We were being guided by what we were seeing from satellite in terms of a dust storm coming off the coast of Africa. And so the dust storm was coming off the coast of Africa. We're trying to navigate where we can get right into the nose of the dust storm so that we can begin to take measurements in a way that will tell us how the chemistry of that dust plume is evolving, how its physics are evolving, how the atmosphere around it is evolving. And then as we go through the dust storm, we take a jog north and we do a cross section of the air masses that are coming off of Africa. And then when we turn around, we're actually moving at about the same speed as the dust storm. And so it's a different type of experiment. When we're moving through the dust storm, it's sort of an Eulerian experiment. You're looking at how, as a function of time, things are changing in a particular position. When you move with a parcel of air or with a particle that is also moving and you track exchanges solely in time, but as a function of that particular system, it's called a Lagrangian experiment. Semi-Lagrangian because we're not exactly at the speed of the dust storm, but we're about at the speed of the dust storm uh, under the optimal conditions of the ship travel. 
And so we did this experiment, which basically nobody thought we could do. And we encountered one of the largest dust storms that had been observed up until about last year, 2020, when there was another huge dust storm that came across and everybody was uh, excited about, me included, um, and wishing I was actually out at sea measuring that dust storm. The blue ship track is just the following year that we did it. You'll notice that's in 2006 because 2005, I was out in the middle of the Caribbean trapped in three hurricanes. So what did it look like? Oh. We did have um, a question about how do you prepare for an expedition like this? Um, that's a really loaded question. So one way, preparing mentally for being out at sea between 30 and 50 days is, is one thing. You go, you're, when you go out for the cruise, you don't, you may see land, but you don't get to walk on land in that period. And so there's a lot of preparation just in terms of your relationships to make sure that you know, people understand that you may not be able to communicate, um, that you're gonna be isolated with a group of people that you may not be very close to, you may just be meeting. Um, that's one set of preparation. But you also got to prepare your instruments uh, to work on the ship, uh, to uh, operate uh, your communication and data protocols to make sure that if you collect samples, you can preserve them. And so a lot of that is done, a lot of that planning is done six, eight months beforehand in the design and using knowledge from going on cruises before, talking to other people who've gone on cruises. And the ship itself is a research vessel. And so it's designed to accommodate research teams and a variety of equipment. But as you can see from this picture, there's rigging that you have to set up to put the sensors in different places uh, at different times and account for the environment. Um, but yeah, the, the preparation is multifaceted. Um, you know, it's a different preparation um, if you're more elderly, uh, on the ship than if you're younger on the ship because there's a lot of stairs on the ship. There's only one service elevator. People aren't allowed to use it. And so, you know, trying to figure out where your room, your bunk might be for 50 days so that you're not tearing up your knees on walking up and down stairs all the time. Seasickness uh, is a big thing as well. Um, I'll tell you, everybody gets seasick um, at some point in time and uh, there is no panacea um, that works. Um, a lot of it is just staying hydrated, staying well rested, and, um, and knowing when to sit down and take, take some time uh, because it can get really rough on the ocean at times. Um, but great question. And we can come back to it if I didn't answer it fully. Um, so this is to contrast a couple of things. One, um, a dusty day versus a clear day. And so you say, what's a dust storm look like at sea? I've seen dust devils wherever, you know, in a parking lot or on a baseball field, what have you. Um, we are nowhere near the Saharan desert, which is the source of all the dust that you see in the lower part of that picture. Your visibility can go down to 20, 30 yards in the middle of the ocean. And so, some of the pictures that we had were some of the first scientific sort of detailed pictures with measurements of how dense the storms are at the surface of the ocean as they move across. When you look down from space, you get one perspective, but sailing through it is a completely different perspective, I have to tell you. Um, and so um, this was the original setup of the first cruise. There's a number of limitations on this setup, but it did allow us to capture some first time and very valuable data. At that same time, the dust was so thick that it literally sedimented out of the air. You could hold your hand out and capture dust in your hand. That's how dense this particular storm was. There were locusts that were falling on the ship. There were birds that were from Africa that were falling on the ship from this dust storm. And we were 10 days of sailing away from the coastline of Africa, literally 
8,000 kilometers away from the closest dust source region. So it's massive amounts of dust. There are megatons of dust that are launched into the atmosphere each time there's a dust storm. And so that's why this is so critical. Um, what's it like being at sea? Um, the preparation is a long preparation. It's very busy uh, at sea. In this first cruise, we had to, to build shelving and uh, a lot of the apparatus that we needed um, to prove that one, there was the scientific integrity of what we did, but also to put um, to put all of the uh, systems together in a way that we could collect the data that we needed. And so we measure using a variety of instruments. One of our key instruments is the sound or sounding in which we attach instruments to a balloon. We let it go from the ship and it takes measurements from the surface of the earth through the stratosphere profiling that uh, dust storm and the atmosphere around it in ways that had never been done before. And so this was one of the unique things that helps us understand the satellites and also provide data to models that improves how we can use those two tools. Um, and then what you see around uh, in, the, in the snapshots is a lab inside the, the ship, uh, some of the oceanographers working, uh, some of the microbiology, um, pre-work that we did and then a number of students. Um, the ocean's a beautiful place, um, a lot of animals. So we're able to fish out there, actually fish for food. And that's a uh, formerly live squid that became calamari for one of the dinners there. And it, the food is great. It needs to be on a ship uh, when you're out there for that long. Um, I'm gonna steam through a bit uh, cause I wanna do the demo. Um, and so this is an example of some of the data that we were able to get, first time data that shows um, the SAL is the Saharan air layer. Uh, Eros is the name of the project. And so the, the project Saharan air layer profile analysis came from us launching mini balloons and collecting data from the surface to the stratosphere and then stitching that data together in such a way that we can now see how the entire atmosphere behaved over the course of that dust storm. And so these are plots that were enabled because of us going out and doing that particular work. We're able to do the same thing in terms of the composition of the atmosphere, looking at the ozone as well. So the previous plot showed the physics of the atmosphere and how it responded. This shows how the chemistry of the atmosphere is responding. Of course, we went out there to look at dust. So we captured the dust and these are images using a scanning electron microscope of the dust that we collected over that same course of time that we were measuring the physics of the atmosphere, measuring the chemistry of the atmosphere and uh, measuring some of the microphysics. And so we would take these uh, particles, we would chemically analyze the particles. And then what we can do is reconstruct the dust storm, chemical, microphysical and bio logical microbial evolution along the pathway. And so this is a snapshot of the cruise track overlaid on a Google Earth sort of um, map that shows the particles that we captured as we moved along and the chemistry of those particles as we moved along. And, and we can connect this to that physics that we had. And finally, we can connect that to the biology of the particles and actually measure the fungi that we collected as we went along. Some of the fungi are human pathogens that A. fumigatus was, turned out to be a very viable human pathogen that's being transported across the tropical Atlantic. Um, we've done this several times uh, to also isolate um, plant pathogens that are threatened, threats to our cash crops. Uh, and so there's a food security aspect of this that we were able to uncover and actually help develop some predictive systems for. So I'm going to wrap right there. Um, I show this picture quite often. This is a picture taken in 2005 as we pulled into Trinidad after escaping those three hurricanes. And if you can, if it's, if it's transmitting well, when you look at the cloud in the middle, at least for me when I was sailing in, I took this picture because I could see a smiling face in the cloud which at that point in time, I was, after coming from a death-defying experience, I said, oh, you know what? Maybe I was meant to do this thing 
and that's my reminder. So it looks like, to me, it always looked like eyebrow, eye, nose, and a little smile on that cloud and two waving hands saying, come on home, you made it. Right. With that, I'll take, I don't know if I take questions now or I go do my experiment. That is awesome. We did have a question. Someone asked, do you get to train with the Navy or with meteorology specialists? I, so I am trained as a meteorologist. Uh, and so the folks that come uh, along with us are the, um, I'll stop sharing that screen. The folks who come along with us are uh, the NOAA Corps. And so we have NOAA Corps officers who are on the ships who are trained to in navigation, in meteorology. Um, there are outstanding uh, technical uh, specialists who are on, who help integrate equipment, um, electronics, uh, communication specialists. Um, and so we have a science team that comes aboard the ship, but the ship provides a crew and a set of officers who are highly specialized, highly skilled, and enable the best science to happen on the ships. And all the protective uh, training and services are done right there on the ship. So we have regular fire drills, uh, abandoned ship drills, man overboard drills, um, you know, drills to in case pirates come and we have to shelter in place and take protective action. We have drills for that. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderfully managed uh, system on the NOAA ship, and I've sailed on some other vessels, NATO vessels, which are also um, the professionals who go along to enable the science, I count as part of the science team. We could not do it without them. That's interesting. Um, <laughs> so the way someone put it, uh, pathogens are hitchhiking from one continent to another on the, on the Sahara nest. Sahara absolutely. Yep, absolutely. They are, there are pathogenic Hitchhikers, um, what we say is though, but they're, they are citizens in larger microbial communities that are all hitchhiking. <laughs> and we need those microbial communities, um, even though we don't understand everything that they're doing in the atmosphere. So some of those microbes are seeding the clouds that we need that will produce rain. So we need those microbes. Some of those microbes, as far as we know, may be, um, playing a role in the atmosphere that is helping sustain some of the stasis that we have against climate change. We don't know that yet. We don't fully know what is in the atmosphere and what role these dust storms play in seeding the atmosphere and keeping it, uh, again, in this sort of equilibrium that we enjoy but don't fully understand. Okay. Um, so we can go ahead and let you get ready to do the um, demo. As you are preparing it, hopefully we can work through some more questions or even after the demo is over, we can get back to answering questions. All right, I'll be back on screen just a second. All righty. Wow, this has been really, really interesting, especially that last part where he just talked about, as someone pointed out, um, these pathogens or members of the micro, um, micro community that he just talked about. Um, For me, Carla, I love calamari. I don't know if I could have eaten it from the ship, like seeing the squid fresh, right? Like right. For those <laughs> watching, you know, we didn't see any comments about that, but I also was over here like, wow, that looks pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, I guess it makes sense to fish, but I was like, oh, <laughs> that really is what calamari is. Like, <laughs> <laughs> they don't give it to you like that. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, wow. I really can't imagine, as he said, um, being in these type of environments with you know, very limited connection to family and friends, or even how he said going, um, you know, 30 plus days without stepping on land, that could be that could be very similar to 
you know, if anyone is watching and they have an interesting in space exploration, I'm sure you get that same type of experience where it's like, I'm not touching Earth for a while. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So, so I'm back. All right. We're good to go. Good to go. OK, so what I'm going to do, or I'm going to attempt to do is create smog. I'm at my kitchen. I apologize for any of the mess that you may see in my kitchen. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to create smog in this container, which is empty. All right. And this particular experiment um, was optimized by a colleague who's here, Dr. Gene and Dino, who's over in chemical engineering at ASU. And so I think if you Google her, you'll find sort of the instructions of this, but I can certainly share as well. So the basic premise is I'm going to use this orange peel and I'm going to use some light and the moisture and other components of the atmosphere to generate particles, to demonstrate how aerosols are generated in the atmosphere, or at least one way the aerosols are generated in the atmosphere. So bear with me just a second. I'm going to plug some things in. And what I'm plugging in are two um, sources of radiation. Um, Radiation in our atmosphere allows um, the blue of the sky to be seen. Um, it allows chemical reactions to occur. And one principle of those chemical reactions is the formation of ozone. And what ozone can do when it reacts with organic molecules is create some complex species that lead to the formation of particles. And so that is what I'm going to simulate here by taking two light sources. And these are um, basically microbial light sources. Sometimes you, um, uh, if you, you want to purify a room or purify your bathroom, get rid of some of the microbes that are in bathrooms or near toothbrushes, for example, you can buy some low power um, UV lamps that will generate, uh, they'll basically purify the air, but also purify um, objects that are exposed to that light. Well, these UV lamps can also generate ozone. And so I'm going to use them to generate ozone inside this chamber. And that ozone is going to react with some of the gases that are emitted from this orange peel. The gases that are emitted from the orange peel, just a regular navel orange, the gases that are emitted from the orange peel are a particular type of organic that will, when reacting with ozone, form organic aerosol. All right, and so we're going to hopefully see in just a few minutes how that works out. But right now, you, you notice that as I put this these orange peels in this container, and I'll take a laser pointer that hopefully will work for me. When I have a laser pointer, or take this laser pointer, you can't see the beam of the laser pointer. You can only see when the laser hits an object. Mm. When the laser hits an object, I don't know if you can see that. Um, you can see where the laser is scattering off that object, but you can't see the beam. And so if I shine the laser through the chamber, you don't see any beam. I should put it this way. You cannot see any beam. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover this up and turn the lights on. And by covering it up, you want to protect your eyes from the UV radiation, but you also want to prevent the UV radiation from uh, the visible radiation from decomposing your ozone. So you want to create enough ozone in here to um, to react with the gases that are being emitted from the orange peel to create the particles. And once the particles are formed, 
then when I pass the laser light through that chamber with a lot of particles, the particles will scatter the light. And they'll scatter the light in a similar way that clouds scatter light. You don't see the individual particles, you see the light that's scattered from the individual particles. And so basically we'll form a cloud of smog in this chamber that will be visible perhaps to the naked eye, but certainly to a scattering, uh, they will scatter this laser um, pointer in time. Now the major thing I've got to do is make sure my laser is working. So now I think you can see that the laser is working pretty well, but you cannot see a beam out here. And so when I pass this beam through here in about three minutes, I'll set a timer, in about three minutes, I'll pass the beam through, and instead of seeing nothing in between the beam and my hand, when I pass it through the chamber, I'm going to see basically the beam all the way through the light path. And that scattering along the light path is evidence that there are particles along the light path that were there now, that are there now, that were not there before. Let me set my timer. And if there are any questions, I can actually take questions while this is cooking up. And so this is an example of photochemistry that happens in our Earth's atmosphere all the time, but it happens actually in every atmosphere that is exposed to any type of solar radiation coming through. So it's happening in the atmosphere of Venus, even though the clouds block a lot of stuff, it happens in the atmosphere of Mars. In fact, the Martian atmosphere and its dust, we can learn a lot about the dust and the photochemistry and heterogeneous chemistry uh, in our atmosphere. Our, it, when we learn about the heterogeneous chemistry of dust in our atmosphere, we can translate that to understanding what's happening on the Martian atmosphere and actually do some comparisons. Uh, there's some similar dust compositions. Uh, on Earth and on Mars and atmosphere and on other dusty planets. And so understanding as much as we can about the Earth system actually informs how we understand extraterrestrial systems. And in fact, when I was uh, in Sicily, I was looking at dust particles, um, but these grains were in interstellar molecular clouds. And so I'm actually trans I'm translating a lot of that understanding to understanding what's happening on the Earth closer to the surface and what we call the troposphere, the lower atmosphere. Wow. Um, so we did have um, questions related to, let's see. So there were two questions that kind of hit on the same thing as far as what high school students can do um, right now um, as far as you know, what they should, uh, sorry, let me get to what she actually said. Um, what type, what types of classes uh, that middle and high school students should take if they are interested in a similar career? Um, and then also um, very similar, someone asked about internships for high school students in this subject. Okay, so I would say take as much um, math and college prep courses in science as possible. If you've got earth science courses or earth science clubs, um, participate in those. Those will get you um, access to a lot of what is needed for this. Uh, computer courses, data analysis courses, those are always good um, depending on your high school. But really, um, any courses that allow you to think and be creative, teach critical thinking, uh, at an advanced level or good. So let's say you're going to a high school and it's not the magnet high school in science, but there's some accelerated courses in humanities and creative writing. I'd encourage you to take those because those allow you to teach you how to read and critically analyze things. And those tools are going to be really helpful in science as well. And so there are always limitations but you can always work around limitations in creative ways. And that's what science is about. It's about, there's some challenge, which is a limitation. And you say, how do I figure that out? And those critical thinking skills are really found in the classes of great teachers. And so a lot of people ask those questions. If you have teachers who are teaching you how to learn, I don't care what that subject is, take that hard teacher. And that's what's gonna help you through. 
That is another awesome. question. The other question was, oh, high school internships. Mm -hmm. So I actually ran a weather camp program for middle school and high schoolers for almost 20 years while I was at Howard. Um, some of those programs are still going. And there's a few clearinghouses. Um, I think the Institute for Broadening Participation has a clearinghouse on high school science internships. Um, I think that, oh, I can actually see aerosols coming out. So I'm going to, I'm going to hold that thought. And hopefully you can see this. I'm going to cut off my UV lights. And this is the reveal. I think you can see, well, now my laser pointer is not working, but you might be able to see. Ah, my laser pointer stopped working there. Can you see the beam in there now? I think you can see it. Yep, I think you can see the beam. So you can see scattering through the through the chamber right now. You can vaguely see. And if I bring this closer, actually, I, I think I can. If you can see my screen, I can see aerosols escaping. If I do something like that, you might be able to see coming out of the top aerosols. So, Dr. So, Morris, what, um, Dr. Morris, what are the chemicals that are escaping? So those are, let me turn off my timer. <laughs> so um, basically what you've got happening in here is a reaction between some of the organics that are coming off of the um, orange, which is sort of citrines, a doubly bonded uh, organic species. And when ozone reacts with that, it sort of sits down. Um, the ozone is a, th is a triatomic molecule that happens to really love doubly, bond, double, doubly bonded carbon species, carbonaceous species. And so the orange is emitting a particular type of organic species that is rich in, in these double bonds. The ozone comes, sits on those double bonds, sort of breaks apart and forms these diketones, or what we call them, diketones, and it basically sits down on the organic molecule and leaves two oxygen atoms on there and then releases uh, the other in terms of water or something like that. And so what you're seeing are large organic molecule aggregates that are coming off that have been, uh, that have reacted with some of the moisture in the air to form particles, but they're basically organic aerosols. And so they're sort of agglomerations of these organics that have come off of the orange. So even when you smell an orange, you sort of smell, you're basically smelling some of the organics that that orange is emitting. Um, these are combinations of a number of species that come when those organics that you smell from the orange are oxidized. And it actually happens in the atmosphere. We've accelerated the reaction quite a bit. What's causing the vapor? What's in that vapor? That we're seeing. That vapor are the organics, it's moisture, uh, water, and the organic aerosols. The water is coming from the atmosphere? The water is coming from, is already in the atmosphere. So we're using, you know, the chamber was never empty. It was full of air and moisture. And the moisture in the air combined with the organics and the ozone led you to these other organic particle products which are large enough because they agglomerate to scatter light. And so because they scatter light, but they scatter all of the visible light, similarly, it looks like a white, wispy smoke. And that's what you see. Okay. But it's, it's non-toxic. You, you don't want it to displace all of your oxygen, but it's largely safe. But I will take this outside to air it out shortly. <laughs> I figured it was safe because you were doing it in the kitchen. <laughs> um, well, you said do an experiment that someone could do at home. So there's a couple of caveats here, a couple of caveats. One, when you're using a UV source, you should either, you know, use UV goggles. Of course, these are light safe. You buy these as uh, household products. But even as household products, you do not look at them. So that's why completely shrouded 
before you turn on any light sources, right? You don't turn on the light sources and then shroud it because that's giving the chance that you, you might damage your eyes. So you cover it completely and then you turn it on. And in fact, if you're gonna buy any of these devices, buy ones that have switches, opposing switches. So it doesn't, when you plug it in, it doesn't come on right away. There's a safety element where you control when it comes on that allows you to be able to protect yourself before you turn it on or exposed to UV radiation. So I have a question and I'm gonna let Carlin ask you a few questions in the chat. So you said this experiment simulates smog. Yes. So what are the organics and smog and how, so what would simulate the orange pill that you have as smog is created in our atmosphere? So one of yeah, one of the things that's missing here that's that's often present in smog um, is something, uh, um, a pollutant called nitrogen oxides or a class of pollutants called nitrogen oxides. Um, and there's also soot uh, that often is present in smog that comes from incomplete combustion of organics. And so smog tends to happen because we're burning or combusting uh, an organic material, a gasoline, a biofuel of some sort. We're not combusting it completely. So we're not completely converting it into water and carbon dioxide. And so you get these byproducts, which are incompletely converted from whatever the original organic was into CO2 and water. A lot of times those are carboxylic acids or a class of compounds called carboxylic acids. Sometimes there are a class of compounds called ketones. Sometimes there are a class of compounds called uh, aldehydes. And, and then you can have combinations of these ketones, aldehydes, or carboxylic acids with the nitrogenous compounds, the nitrogen containing compounds. And those form a different suite of aerosols. Um, those particles, in addition to the carbonaceous particles, the, the sooty particles that come out of an exhaust, that forms smog. And so we've eliminated the carbonaceous particles are not here, like the purely carbonaceous particles are not here, and certainly the nitrogen oxides, we have no source for that other than the background that might be here. But it generates particles of a similar size distribution. So visually, what you're looking at is just the physical effects of having small particles distributed in air scattering visible light in the same way, where they don't scatter more blue than they scatter more red. So if they're scattering all of the wavelengths of visible light about the same, it looks white. But if it scatters, it absorbs a lot of the longer wavelengths, the reds and the oranges, and scatters the blue preferentially, we get what we see in the sky, a blue sky, because it's scattering in the shorter wavelength um, range of the visible spectrum more effectively than it's scattering in the longer wavelength. So these, the particle size will dictate how it scatters uh, across the visible spectrum. The closer it is to a particular wavelength of light, um, the more effectively it will scatter that light. So we were curious in the chat, is this not a, um, I don't want to say low cost way, but is this not an avenue to create aromatherapy at home? Um, it, hmm, that's interesting. Um, I would say that you can do aromatherapy cheaper than this. <laughs> 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 and <laughs> you know, I, I think the, based on the very limited, uh, you know, information or knowledge, I wouldn't even call it knowledge, things that I know about aromatherapy, I think the most effective aromatherapy agents are like the lavenders and the, those things you can, you can do with just by boiling uh, the oil and vaporizing it in that way. And this is, this is a little complex to try to get the best <laughs> aromatherapy agents into the air. Um, That's my advice as an atmospheric chemist. <laughs> <laughs> and are you familiar with them um, considering using UV to sanitize classrooms for COVID-19? 
Well, that's an interest. You know, the the, the COVID nineteen era has been interesting from a science standpoint. I'm gonna I'm not gonna pivot from your question. I'm gonna answer your question. But I'm gonna take a roundabout way in that it has forced more interdisciplinary conversations than might normally have taken place because you have, you know, the virologists are all in on this. The pharmacologists are all in on this. Um, and this is airborne and stays airborne for some time. So the aerobiologists and a lot of atmospheric scientists are in on this too, because if it's a particle and it lives in the atmosphere and moves around, like as a particle, I know how to deal with that. Now, I don't know as an expert the virology of those particles, but if you have a virus that all of a sudden is in the air and you need to know how it moves around the air, then our two communities need to be talking to each other because I've got knowledge that you need to solve your problem. And you know, if viruses are always gonna be around as climate changes, you've got knowledge that I need to be a little more aware of to sort of address the things that I need. And so that's happened a lot more recently where there's been some really nice models of deposition of viruses onto surfaces, you know, viral movement in, you know, in small spaces, uh, indoor spaces. Um, the viruses behave differently than fungi and bacteria uh, from my understanding. And so, I think when you when you are using UV to sterilize something, most of the time that's going to be functional for bacteria and maybe fungi. I'm not sure how effective it is for the virus, although the virus from the studies has said it's not active on a surface for a very long after a while. But what is inactivating it? I'm not familiar with what if it's UV radiation that's inactivating it, or it's just the fact that it's something else. And so um, I think it's always safer to, to use UV in combination with other methods for sanitation. Yes. Um, is it singularly the foolproof method? I'm not sure. I think it may be that in combination with some other things. Okay. Um, so I think that, um, We'll get to one more question and then uh, let, you, let you share some closing words with us. Um, but, you know, the last question that we want to get to is, um, are there any book resources that might be helpful for middle and high school students? Um, like book resources in particular for, for what? on this topic on on atmospheric sciences or dust or so or there's a there okay so there's there is hmm it depends on the topic i'm not sure i love reading and that's why i would say that uh you know if you get a great reading or humanities teacher um that can make a world of difference you know and i absolutely love science i will always say take as much math as you can but there is no, I don't believe in the separation of arts and sciences in ways that people promote. It's either this or it's that. Um, I think you really need both. So if it's, if it's about, say, air pollution, there's a nice book by a journalist called Choke. And that gives a very nice overview of the challenges of air quality. Uh, globally, and it's pretty accessible, certainly accessible at the high school level. Um, if you're talking about books, that's probably a, a good book on um, air quality, air pollution. A recent book on, I think there's a book called The Secret, mm, give me one second, I might have the book over here, and I can tell you a book on the mm -hmm. dust. Since I'm close to my library, I might be able to find it. Uh, <laughs> This is why we have him as a guest. Dr. Morris is so knowledgeable. And uh, I don't see it. I'll have to send it to you. Okay. Secret Life of Dust. Yeah. No, nope, it's called the Secret Secret Life of Dust. So 
Great thing about Amazon is all you need is a book title. You can find it. The Secret Life of Dust is a very nice book on dust that, again, is accessible. It's a general sort of book. And if you're looking for books on um, atmospheric chemistry or atmospheric sciences in general, you know, there's a number of environmental books that are coming out. Um, I'd have to think about what the best, well, you know, the one that I've enjoyed the most on environmental sciences is. I, I don't, on the tip of my tongue, I, I, I can't make a recommendation, but I, definitely on the air pollution, Choke was pretty good, and The Secret Life of Dust is very nice on dust, and it covers, when we say dust, you think of the little dust bunnies that are in the corner, and you walk around the house, and you see some stuff, and it irritates you because you think you should have got that out. There's more to dust than that, but the complexity of that thing that you're looking at uh, is profound, and I think that book does a good job of getting you to look at things that you see that are common in a different way. Um, so, um, and uh, so to the question of the camps and internships, that's a great question. Um, you know, a lot of things have been pushed into the virtual space right now because of the pandemic. And so that actually opens up the possibilities for high school students to, to intern. Um, because the liability or risk of bringing high school students into lab spaces has been a barrier uh, for some time. It's a different type of experience, but at least it can get you connected. Um, I actually have high school interns right now um, who are working on different projects. Um, so I think reaching out to your local university, your local community college, and just you know, articulating your interest, you might be able to find uh, folks who will mentor it again. It's a little bit easier now if, if you can find folks um, like that. And then I think um, Institute of Broadening Participation has a clearinghouse. There's a couple of clearinghouses um, online. Um, your local weather service, your local uh, WFOs are probably closed right now because of the pandemic. But um, when you get a chance, contacting your local departments of environmental quality and your local weather forecasting office, there might be opportunities there as well. All right, I think those are all the questions that- uh, And look, yeah, I would say in the future, um, we hope to get the weather camp started back up at ASU. And so uh, in the future, um, certainly not this coming summer, but maybe by next summer, we'll be back up and running uh, weather camps and um, you can always inquire, uh, inquire at ASU about uh, camps uh, at ASU. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Morris. I just want us to, you, to give us a few closing words for um, future atmospheric chemist or is it just atmospheric chemists that study dust? Whoever wants to study dust no and have a, <laughs> and, and, or, or do research on a boat, right? Because uh. uh, You know, that's um, closing words. Um, one, don't be, um, take, a, take a risk. You know, I, I think that's one thing I, I it's, it's become something that I do now but it was not something that I thought I was going to do ever leading up to that point. It, it, I began to think about doing research on a ship, not because I wanted to get on a ship, but because the problem that I wanted to solve or address couldn't be solved effectively any other way. And so as I was talking to some oceanographers, good friends of mine um, who went on ships often, I said, you know, do you think this could be done? Do you think that? And they're like, oh yeah, sure, just come on out. And it was, it was really because of the relationship that I had with other scientists, trusting them <laughs> and, and being able to ask questions across disciplinary lines um, that you know, enabled me to have the career that I'm, I'm having, enjoying right now. And so you know, one thing is you know, keep your love of curiosity forward. Right? You have to get especially in a particular thing and you want to have a depth, 
But if you're open to just exchanging with people from completely or very different disciplines in open ways, um, I think that's where the best science gets done. I think the best science gets done at the interfaces of uh, disciplines. Um, there's great science that's done everywhere. There's no doubt about that. But they're really challenging and um, and they're really challenging problems at the interfaces. And they're challenging problems for which we may not have the language right now because we speak, I speak in the language of chemistry and a virologist speaks in the language of virology. But if at the nexus is viruses may be playing roles in, you know, what if viruses are playing roles in the upper stratosphere? Well, I have some knowledge on how to do work in the upper stratosphere, but if I'm, I need to work with viruses, I need to talk to a virologist to say, okay, well, how does that thing express proteins and in what way and how might these physical factors influence? He's got to give me that or she has to give me that information. And so that willingness to work across the lines and say, okay, I don't understand virology language. You're going to have to break that down for me. And maybe we got to do it over coffee or over beer or whatever. We got to break that down so we can solve this problem. And it's, that is the future, I think, of the most challenging parts of science, whether it be, you know, big data and AI and machine learning and how we're going to incorporate that into creative ways of exploring the environment or deep space, um, whether it's really tackling the more difficult parts of the climate change issue, which are human problems and require physical scientists to talk to humanists and talk to behavioral scientists. Um, you know, we rely a lot on policy and policy speak is very different from science, but if it's not based on good science, you know, even policy that is based on good science, but not based on a good understanding of science can be bad policy, but well-meaning a policy. And so I think it's these crossover points that have, that hold the greatest promise and opportunity for the next generation. And that means never give up reading and writing even if you want to do numbers <laughs> because it is about communication all the time uh i think it's a very important thing so that's that's what i'd say and look for creative opportunity don't be afraid to ask people um if you i love to travel you know i you know fantasize about being a pirate or explorer and sailing around the world and i kind of do that now i don't do the piracy but i i do the exploring and i sail around the world a little bit so um You'd be surprised what you can do if you're open to the possibilities and not thinking about what limits you, but what, you know, what limits you want to move beyond. So that's what I would, that's what I would say. And feel free to send me an email. I mean, I say that all the time. I'm chided for saying that, but so few people actually say, you know what? I heard this talk. I'm just going to send that person an email and say, what a, have you ever thought of this? Or do you know of anybody who knows how to do it? And I go, yeah, I do. Here you go. But oh, here's a connection. And I said, yeah, I mean, final word is, you know, it's always about people and who, you know, it is about who you know. That doesn't mean it's not about what you know, but getting to know things requires opportunities and opportunities requiring knowing people. And so again, it's not, one or the other. It's working both together in ways that provide greater access to more people. And I am, I am committed to greater access for people who have been excluded for centuries in this country uh, and formative history of this country. And so uh, I encourage, um, I encourage people to reach out and ask questions because I'm, I'm not going to ignore a question from anyone. And I, and I, it's a huge network of folks, some of whom are on this, uh, in my video screen right now that if you just ask the question, okay, I'll connect you to someone. So I may not have the answer. I'm going to connect you to someone who I think has the answer. And if they don't have the answer, I know them well enough to know that they're going to connect you to that's next person. And now your network's just started blowing up like a real network, like a network of people who care what you, what happens to you. So um, that would be my closing word. Yeah, I have a colleague and friend of mine who's like, Dr. Morris has trained probably 
85 percent of the black atmospheric scientists <laughs> in the know. country. <laughs> you definitely need more atmospheric scientists if that's the case. <laughs> I don't um, think that's good. But I, I like I like to connect people, and I like uh, mm -hmm. you know I think ultimately our greatest product is the people that we enable mm -hmm. as scientists, as, as an educator. You, whatever question may come to my mind came to a hundred other people's minds. And I may have just been at the right place, right time, right resources to move it forward. And then the whole scientific community gets to move forward and then there's a brand new set of questions and everybody's asking questions and then, you know, we keep, you know. So the questions are always gonna be there and the questions, went, the questions that are being asked will always be asked. But the people who come in with the unique perspectives, that's what we have to keep bringing into the scientific community to ask the tough questions, to ask the more inclusive questions. And that's why access is so imp important, is you know, if, if there are no questions from holistic perspectives and all the questions are you know, very reductive, sort of Western hegemonic, you know, this is how knowledge is known, then science will grow, but it will grow along a really narrow path. And the benefits of science will also be narrowly distributed. And the more people we bring into the scientific community and more people we bring in that conversation with different perspectives means that a larger part of the global community is served by science and technology. That's why access is so important. That's why networking is important to be inclusive and, and and that's one of the things I'm committed to is, yeah, I want to see a lot more black atmospheric scientists, a lot more Latinx atmospheric scientists, a lot more indigenous atmospheric scientists, because the knowledge in those communities that could be leveraged to really help us adapt and understand climate change or aerobiology or AI or machine learning or big data or you name it is lost when you say, no, this is only for these people. You know, not my network, I don't know anybody black, so I just won't refer anybody black for this. No, that is, that's actually constraining science in an unscientific way. And personally, I reject that. So I, I work against that, actively. Those are great last words. Um, as far as, your email for if people want to reach out, um, you know, for mentorship or for questions. Um, what email is that? Is that your ASU email? That yeah, they can send to the ASU email. Okay. Um, you know, I think personally, what you just said, I think that it's such an exciting time to be in science. And personally, I feel like that's why the work that Singlink does is so important to show youth how exciting and cool it is, like the experiences that you shared during this workshop um, and how it is accessible to them and that they do belong, you know, as someone said in the comments, as, you know, female, male, black, Hispanic, atmospheric scientists. And so we want to thank you, Dr. Morris, for sharing your knowledge, for sharing your incredible STEM journey with us. Um, and thank everyone who tuned in for this edition of our STEM in the City. Okay. Thanks, yeah, thanks Carolyn and thanks uh, to Kiwa. I'm sure I'll be talking to you soon anyway, but yeah. good seeing you and thanks. Thank you, all right.